Chapter 26, Seed Plants. Seed plants dominate the landscape and play an integral role in human society. There are palm trees that grow on islands and supply coconuts. Wheat is grown in most of the world to supply food. Cotton supplies the fiber that produces most of our clothing. And poppies supply both medications and dangerous drugs. In this chapter, we'll look at the evolution of seed plants and then focus on gymnosperms specifically, move on to angiosperms, and discuss the role of seed plants. Seed plants evolved about 500 million years ago, and they tend towards dominant sporophyte generations. We've seen this through a systematic reduction in their overall gametophyte size. All seed plants are heterosporous, and their seeds and pollen don't require water. Gymnosperms seem to have fully evolved about 300 million years ago, where angiosperms evolved about 100 to 125 million years ago. The fossil plant at Elkinesia polymorpha, a seed fern, is seen here, and it developed in the Devonian period. It's considered one of the earliest seed plants known to date. Seed firms produce their seeds along branches without specialized structures. What makes them the first true unique seed plants is that they eventually develop structures called cupules to enclose and protect the ovule. The ovule is the female gametophyte in its associated tissues. This structure develops into the seed upon fertilization. Seed plants resembling modern tree ferns became more numerous and diverse in the coal swamps of the Carboniferous period. We've discussed this previously. Fossil records indicate that the first gymnosperms most likely originated during the Paleozoic era, during the middle of the Devonian period. Following the wet Mississippian and Pennsylvania periods, which were dominated by those giant fern trees, the Permian period was unusually dry, and this gave an edge to reproductive seed plants, which were better able to produce in dry spells, because remember, their seeds, or pollen, don't require any water. Plants that belonged to the ginkgo group were the first gymnosperms to appear during the Lower Jurassic. Gymnosperms expanded in the Mesozoic area, supplanting firms in the landscape and reaching their greatest levels of diversity during this time. It was during the Jurassic period, where there were quite a few cycads around, that we saw angiosperms popping up. Seeds are interesting biological structures that contain a diploid embryo that will germinate into a sporophyte eventually, not necessarily right away. They have storage tissues that developed to feed the seeds as they waited to grow, and layers on the outside harden to prevent desiccation or water loss over time. Pollen contains sperm that are actually capable of swimming down specialized poly pollen tubes, which are protective structures that keep the incorrect sperm from fertilizing the appropriate egg. Angiosperms appeared about 100 to 125 million years ago and rapidly diversified, although we aren't really sure why. They developed parallel to gymnosperms, not from a gymnosperm, and evolved fruits and flowers. Amborella trichopoda might have been the very first ancestor, according to recent genetic information. This is a small plant that's native to some islands in the South Pacific. Angiosperms produce gametes and separate organs that are housed within the flower structure. They are the most diverse phylum on Earth, and a lot of them have evolved alongside their mutualistic pollinators. They contain ovules that grow into seeds. The material surrounding the ovule is what you know of as fruit. There are some false, some false fruits, and there's a lot of information that goes into classifying them, as you'll see when you read this chapter. We looked at this phylogenetic tree before that shows the evolutionary relationships between plants and hopefully some of them look really familiar, like bryophytes and lycophytes. We're going to focus on that very bottom box which contains gymnosperms and angiosperms. We'll expand on the gymnosperms first. Gymnosperms are plants with naked seeds, or no protection at all. They're a diverse, monophyletic group coming from a single ancestor. Their seeds are not enclosed by an ovary, but they do have specialized levels in a tight arrangement that create what you know of as a pine cone. There's some specialized tissue around the embryo called the integument, and it does give them a little bit of protection from their environment. They don't tend to lose their leaves each year, which means they're capable of undergoing photosynthesis year-round. However, pine needles, as you can imagine, are quite small, so they can't undergo photosynthesis at great rates. This keeps the plants themselves from growing terribly quickly. The life cycle of gymnosperms involves the alternation of generations. There are monocetous plants, which contain both sexes, and dicetious plants, which have separate male and female trees. Let's take a look at the life cycle of a conifer. An example are pine trees. Pine trees carry both male and female sporophylls on the mature sporophyte plant. 
so you could call them monocetous. They are heterosporous and therefore generate two different types of spores. The male spores are called microspores, and the female spores are called megaspores, and it's just a reference to their size. The female cones grow on the upper branches where they are fertilized by pollen that's blown through the wind that came from the male cones. The pollen swims down the pollen tube to fertilize the microspore, which is 1N. This creates a 2N seed that can fall to the ground and grow into a mature tree. It's a very simple process. We're going to look at gymnosperm diversity. Modern gymnosperms are classified into four phyla. Conifera phyta, the cyads, and the ginkophytes are all similar in their production of their secondary vascular system as well as their pattern of seed development. However, these three phyla actually don't seem to be that closely phylogenetically related, which is kind of odd, but it happens. Natophyta are considered the closest group to angiosperms because they produce a, a true xylem tissue capable of moving water and nutrients throughout the plant very effectively. Conifers are the dominant phylum of the gymnosperms with the most variety of species. They're typically tall trees that usually bear either scale-like or needle-like leaves. Water evaporation from the leaves is reduced by their very thin shape and their extremely thick cuticle, hence why pine trees are pokey. Snow slides very easily off of these needle-shaped leaves, keeping the low light in winter and decreasing the breaking of branches. Adaptations to cold and dry weather explain the predominance of conifers at high altitudes and in cold climates. Conifers include familiar evergreen trees like spruces, pines, firs, and cedars. A few species are dioecious and do actually lose their leaves in the fall. The European larch and the turmeric are examples of dioecious conifers. Many coniferous trees are harvested for paper pulp and also for timber. The wood of conifers is more primitive than the wood of angiosperms because it lacks those vessel elements I mentioned. Therefore, it's referred to as softwood. Cycads exist in mild climates, and they have large, broad leaves and bear very large cones. There's only about 100 species of them now, even though they were the dominant plant during the Jurassic period. The single surviving species of the ginkophytes is the group ginkgo biloba. They have fan-shaped leaves and are unique among seed plants because of the way that their veiny pattern exists in their leaves. Ginkgo plants are known to turn yellow in autumn and their leaves fall from the trees. For centuries, ginkgo biloba was cultivated by Chinese monks in various monasteries, which ensured its preservation. It's planted in public spaces because it's really resistant to pollution, so architects and landscapers don't have to worry about having a dead tree in front of their building. Male and female organs are produced on separate plants, and usually we only plant male trees because the seeds produced by the female plant have the off-putting smell of rancid butter or a little bit like puke. Netophytes are the closest relative to modern angiosperms and include three very dissimilar generations of plants. Like angiosperms, they have very broad leaves which allows for high rates of photosynthesis. In tropical and subtropical zones, netophytes tend to be simply vines or small shrubs though. Ephedra occurs in dry areas on the west coast in the United States and down in Mexico. Ephedra's small scale-like leaves are the source of the compound ephedrine, which is used as a medication in some instances and as an extraordinarily dangerous diet supplement. With that, we'll end our study of gymnosperms and move down to angiosperms. From their humble and still obscure beginnings during the early Jurassic period, angiosperms, or flowering plants, have evolved to dominate most terrestrial ecosystems. With more than a quarter million species, the angiosperm phyla, known as anthophyta, is second only to insects in terms of diversification. The success of angiosperms is largely due to the reproductive structures of flowers and fruit. The function of the flower is to ensure pollination. The flowers a side function also provide protection for the ovule and the developing embryo inside its receptacle. The function of the fruit is seed dispersal. They also protect the developing seed. The different structures or tissues on the fruit, like the sweet flesh, wings, parachutes, and spines that grab onto as you walk by plants in the desert, reflect the dispersal strategies that help spread seeds. This image depicts the structure of a perfect flower. Perfect flowers are simply flowers that produce both male and female floral organs. The flower here only has one carpel, but there are actually some flowers that have clusters of carpels all together. 
You can see the stigma, which physically catches the pollen, the style, or essentially the pollen tube, and then the ovule, where the nagrosporangium can develop. Over on the right-hand side, you have the male organs. The anther is where the microsporangia develop, and then the filament holds the anther high into the air so the pollen can eventually be caught by wind. The life cycle of the angiosperm is shown here. We look closely at the anthers and carpels that are the structures that shelter the actual gametophytes, which are the pollen grain, the male version, and the embryo sac, the female version. There's a double fertilization process that occurs that's really unique to angiosperms. The ovule is sheltered within the ovary of the carpel and it contains the megasporangium, which is protected by two layers of tissue and the ovary wall. Within each megasporangium, the megaspore undergoes mitosis, and it creates four separate megaspores. Three of them are small, and one of them is large. Only the large one actually survives, and it produces the female gametophyte. That's what we call the embryo sac. The megaspore divides three times to form an eight-cell stage. Four of these cells migrate to two separate poles in the embryo sac. Two of them are going to move back together towards the equator and eventually fuse, and this forms a 2N polar nucleus. Three cells away from the egg form antipodals, and the two cells that are closest to the egg create synergids. The mature embryo sac contains one egg cell, two synergids, or helper cells, and three antipodal cells, and then those two polar nuclei that are central to the cell. When the pollen grain reaches the stigma, the pollen tube extends from the grain, grows down the style, and then enters the micropyle, which is an opening in the integuments of the ovule. Two sperm cells are, de are deposited within the embryo sac. A double fertilization event then occurs. One sperm and egg combine, combined, and that actually forms our zygote, our future embryo, and the other sperm fuses with the 2N polar nuclei that we created. And this makes a 3N cell that will develop into the endosperm. The endosperm is a tissue that serves as food that the zygote will eat as it develops and into a mature plant. Angiosperms only have a single phyla, the anthophyta, and they appear to be a monophyletic group, so they have just one ancestor. We split flowering plants into two big groups, monocots, which are things like grasses and lilies, and eudicots, or dicots. They form a polyphyletic group. There are some basal, basal angiosperms that are essentially a group of plants to, that seem to have branched off before the separation of monocots and dicots because they exhibit some traits from both groups. We largely study just the monocots and dicots. Let's take a quick look at those basal plants. The magnolia lidae are represented by the magnolias. These are tall trees that bear large fragrant flowers and have numerous internal structures. They're considered archaic or old-fashioned evolutionarily. Laurel trees produce fragrant leaves and small inconspic inconspicuous flowers that are easy to miss. They tend to grow mostly in warmer climates and are tall, street, tall trees and shrubs. The plants in this group also include cinnamon and the avocado tree. Another group within the basal plants includes water lilies, lotus, and similar plants. All species thrive in fresh water and have leaves that float on the water surface or even under the water. Water lilies are particularly prized by gardeners and have graced ponds and pools for thousands of years. Plants in the monocot group are primarily identified by the presence of a single cotyledon or leaf inside the seedling. Other anatomical features shared by monocots include a vein that runs parallel to the length of the leaves and the flower parts arranged in either a six or three fold symmetry. True woody tissues is very rare in monocots. In palm trees, vascular and parenchyma tissues produced by the primary and secondary thickening of the meristems forms the trunk. The pollen from the first angiosperms was monosacculate, which means it only contained a single pore through which sperm could enter in its outer layer. This feature is actually still seen in a lot of, a lot of modern monocots. 
vascular tissue of the stem is not arranged in any particular pattern and the root system is mostly adventitious and it doesn't really have any particular positioning. There's no major taproot. The roots just grow where they need to go. Monocots include a lot of familiar plants like true lilies, orchids, grasses, and palm trees. Most important crops are monocots too, so when you think of anything you can grow on a farm, rice, cereal, corn, sugar, bananas, pineapple, things of that nature, they're all monocot plants. Eudicots, or true dicots, are characterized by the presence of two cotyledons, or leaves, in the developing shoot. Veins form a network in the leaves, and flower plants come in four, five, or even many whorls. Vascular tissue forms a ring in the stem, and monocots, remember we said vascular tissue was scattered around the stem. Dicots are herbaceous and produce woody tissues. Most dicots also produce pollen that is triporate, so it has three different openings within the seed for sperm to enter. The root system is usually anchored by one major taproot that forms from something called the radical in the embryo. Dicots compose two-thirds of all flowering plants. Many species exhibit characteristics that belong to either group, so it can actually be a little difficult to exclaim something as either a monocot or a dicot. Here's a comparison of some of the structural characteristics in these two different types of plants. So, monocots have a single cotyledon while dicots have two. The veins in monocots we mentioned are parallel while the branching structure is seen in eudicots. For the vascular stem tissue in monocots, it's really scattered, but you can actually see a full ring of xylem and phloem in the stems of eudicot plants. Eudicots also have taproots, pores in their pollen, and they tend to have either four, five, or multiple whorls of petals in their flowering parts. Monocots have either just three or unified multiples of three. The last section of the book is how do we affect plants and how do they affect us? Some of it's good and some of it's bad. Spines and thorns are an example of plant defenses. Good for the plant, definitely bad for us, especially if you've ever tripped while hiking. Some of the ways that plants affect us is positive. They make our world more beautiful, they're a major source of food, and they're the basis of the food chain for other non-human organisms. Here are a few more examples. Quinine, which is extracted from certain trees, is used to treat malaria. Most of our medications come from plants, and most of our musical instruments even come from plants. There are some wide-ranging examples of how humans harvest and use plants to benefit our world. With that, the chapter ends, so make sure you go through and read it. Write notes in your own words. Do the practice problems that exist in OpenStax, and then do some of the activities that exist within Learner. Make sure you're finishing your homework assignment in Learner as well.